Thank you, Rui. And next up, we have Dilek Hakani Tur. She did her PhD at Bilkent University in Turkey and, and spent many years with the, the other speakers at Microsoft. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I hope you can hear me well, though I'm not sure. But uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks, Rui and Alex, for setting the ground. It will be much easier to talk for me now. Um, so let my slide come up. So uh, currently, I am a research scientist at Google, and I'm leading a team of uh, 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 researchers working on conversational systems algorithms research. And I will be giving an overview of the team as well as our wonderful collaborators. Uh, thanks to every one of them also. So uh, our focus is basically uh, building uh, conversational systems that are more human-like, that can help you accomplish tasks. And uh, as uh, was mentioned in the previous talks, uh, this is very challenging. There are a lot of challenges. I'm not going to go over them. Uh, but uh, uh, th the good thing is we are not bored. Uh, and it's easy to come up uh, with problems to solve. Uh, so in the beginning, I want to just separate two types of conversational systems, uh, goal-oriented systems, because that's in my title, task-oriented systems, and chit-chat-based systems. So goal-oriented systems are those systems where you go to when you want to accomplish a task. And it's the goal of the system to understand what you mean, what you need, and then help you accomplish it. On the other hand, the chit-chat-based systems, their main goal is to keep the user engaged and uh, to be able to give natural responses. So the research in these two areas have actually started from uh, two different aspects. But more recently, with the advancements in deep learning, they have been uh, converging more and more. And uh, we, we, uh, we uh, mainly t tackle uh, the uh, task-oriented dialogues. And our mission is basically invent the state of the art uh, for task-oriented conversations. And we view task-oriented dialogues as a game. So in this game, on one side is the user. The user has a goal. They want to accomplish a task or find some information. On the other side, there is a system agent. And the system agent doesn't know the user's goal, but it has access to the data or it has the access to the backend knowledge sources. And uh, they engage or play this game of conversation so that the system learns what the user's goal is and then makes the uh, backend information visible to the user so they can decide on what to do. And uh, we do see this as a collaborative game. And uh, there, the rules of this game are not as strict as the other games, because at each turn, uh, one of the sides can take more than one action. So the turn taking is very flexible. Uh, but similar to other games, the set of actions and state is, is very large. So uh, why learning? Actually, the previous speakers already motivated, but uh, there are a bunch of challenges. Uh, conversational uh, systems uh, is, a, is a challenging task. Building conversational systems is a challenging task. And machine learning provides a bunch of solutions uh, to many of these challenges. That's why we focus on data, data uh, and uh, machine learning methods. Uh, and uh, some of these ch challenges do include uh, variety in natural language and then variety in uh, user requests. Uh, noise in the input, which can come from any of the components, like speech recognition, or it can come from the background uh, when the person is speaking, or in ungrammaticality in users' utterances. Uh, context is very important in understanding what people are trying to achieve. And uh, we do need dialogue level planning, so we don't believe in uh, saving the day type of approaches. We target for longer time, uh, longer time uh, task completion. And uh, we aim to scale uh, because there's a long tail of queries, a long tail of intents, and a bunch of languages. And uh, this is very similar to what Alex was uh, showing before. So the general architecture that's commonly used in goal-oriented dialogue systems is, first, you do conversational language understanding. Given the user's utterance, uh, you try to interpret it in a semantic representation. And we don't believe in designing representations ourselves. We always look at uh, what the backend provides us, what, what the backend wants from us. Because at the end of the day, we need to convert the user's utterances into some query to the knowledge source or the action source. And the next step is dialogue state tracking. And uh, this aims to accumulate information that we get from the users over the course of the dialogue, and then form the final query that we are going to issue to the backend. And next step is dialogue manager, uh, which gets the state as well as the backend information and decides on what action to do next. Is it going to ask for some more information to the user? Is it going to say, present uh, some options? Or is it going to say, 
I don't have, I cannot do because the backend doesn't support it, etc. So there are a bunch of actions the system can take. And the final step is response generation or natural language generation. So uh, the system generates the actions in, in its own language, but the users only understand natural language. So we have this step so that we can go back to the user and respond in natural language. And uh, we do have uh, deep learning or machine learning methods for each of these components. So we do, uh, we do component wise training, as well as we have been focusing on methods where we can do end to end training, uh, when we can uh, combine uh, these two uh, or more, uh, more models. And moving on now, I, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about the components, each of these components. Uh, starting with conversational language understanding. So we do view conversational language understanding as a, a sequence classification problem. There's a sequence of words and then we want to extract a frame from the user's utterance. Uh, we do see the frame as a sequence as well and we do rely on sequence to sequence classification methods. Uh, so this could be uh, recurrent neural nets or it could be transformer networks, et cetera, et cetera. So you can imagine we are working with all of these. Uh, but one, one uh, principle that we have is having a single model that actually covers all the domains and multiple tasks because we believe that uh, one can generalize uh, from data for in each of these domains or for each of these tasks. And at the bottom uh, in yellow I show our published work so you can go back and if you, wanna need, if you need more details, uh, you can check them. And then uh, conversational language understanding, although I'm, I uh, view it as a, as a sequence classification problem, in dialogues, uh, context is very important. So we do encode the conversation context and then provide it as additional information to language understanding. How do we do that? We view each of the sentences in a conversation as, as one bit of information and then we do try to uh, map them to a latent space. So we have a latent space representation for each turn in the dialogue and then we have a latent space representation for the current turn of the, for the current user turn. And what we do is we uh, estimate an attention over the item, over the turns in the memory and uh, we do use that attention to combine uh, the information in the memory into, into a single vector, which we provide as the knowledge encoding to the sequence tagging. And this uh, knowledge encoding could be done through just basic simple weighted summation or it can be uh, done through yet another uh, neural network. And uh, we have shown that if you actually encode the information in the dialogue, this helps a lot in disambiguating or, or better understanding the current turn. And uh, next, next step is dialogue state tracking. So for tracking, uh, the goal is basically using the whole conversation history, uh, which is encoded in the dialogue state in the previous turn, as well as the uh, user's current turn and then language understanding from that current turn to estimate the current dialogue state. And on the right, I have a human-human conversation. So humans, naturally, when they have multiple tasks, they shift from one task to the other. So for example, if they wanna go out, uh, they may look for a movie, they may look for a restaurant, they may look for a cab, etc., etc. And then they do uh, shift from uh, domain to domain. So we do the dialogue state tracking across multiple domains at the same time so that we can use information from one domain in the other one as well. And then we do define the constraints jointly. And uh, dialogue state tracking, uh, we do have our own approach which is based on uh, neural networks again. Uh, the first step is basically extracting candidates from the conversation history. So we do dialogue state tracking per domain per slot. So for example, the time slot, that means extracting 6 and 7 p.m. are possible candidates from the conversation. This way we can deal with very large data sets or even unbounded, unbounded data sets or, or in, in certain cases, even with values that were previously unseen. And uh, what we do is we do estimate a probability for each of these candidates. So there are two additional candidates. Uh, one of them is the user doesn't care about this or the user has not specified the value yet. And then uh, after this step, we do use the most probab probable slot values and we are issuing a query uh, to the backend. And uh, what we have done is we have actually uh, shown that we can share parameters across slots uh, when we use these neural networks and we can actually even share parameters across different domains. And we have shown that if you train a dialogue state tracker in one domain, you can actually use it to bootstrap dialogue state tracking in, a, in another domain easily and you can move from there on. And uh, next step is dialogue policy. So now I'm going back to the uh, game again. So the dialogue policy has access to two bits of information, dialogue state and, uh, and uh, the 
backend results. And its goal is, given those two, to estimate what the next action sh this, the system should take. And uh, then when that est action is taken, the user gives another response and the, and the, and the uh, dialogue continues. And we do have three-stage training uh, for learning dialogue uh, manager policies. So first of all, we do collect large corpora and we do use supervised learning uh, so that we can estimate what the next action should be. This is uh, looking at just the next action, but not considering the longer term uh, goal, longer term rewards. We do train re reinforcement learning dialogue policies. And in here, we actually optimize for the longer term reward of, uh, for uh, dialogue. And uh, the next stage is interactive learning. So interactive reinforcement learning. So users, naturally, they give a lot of feedback uh, even in uh, throughout the dialogue. And it could be possible to convert this feedback into some form of reward that you can use uh, when uh, you're training the reinforcement learning algorithm. And uh, this is uh, quite similar uh, to how actually humans learn through imitation, through uh, trial and error, through exploration, and then getting feedback uh, from uh, parents or teachers or others. And next step is natural language generation. So uh, this step is needed because we want to convert the system action into a natural language sequence. And for this task, we mainly use sequence-to-sequence -sequence network. So we uh, convert the system action into a sequence. And we do uh, use attention. And then we estimate, a, uh, generate a natural language sequence. And in our work, actually, we have looked into uh, how the values of the slots affect the surface form realization, or if actually these type of networks are learning uh, the sentence plans, or do we need to plan these in advance? And uh, so I described the overall uh, system architecture, which we train either component-wise or end-to-end. -end. But uh, for each of these, we do need a lot of data. Where do we get this data from? And uh, so first step, uh, for reinforcement learning, we don't experiment with real users, not yet, before we, uh, come to, we get to a stage where the system is good enough, but we bootstrap uh, the dialogue system using user simulators. So just like we build system agents, we do build user agents. And the user agents aim to mimic real users and interact with the system so that the system, that through, during reinforcement learning, it can explore new actions, some of which, which may not even make much sense but then learn. And uh, we do use these uh, to collect data so that we can bootstrap all of the components of a dialogue system, which I'll, I'll talk uh, uh, later on. And then we do use simulators for performing evalu evaluation of different dialogue systems. And uh, we don't believe in a single form of user. We do actually uh, generate multiple multitude of users. So inspired by the work on personality traits, we def defined a set of criteria which, def uh, which uh, change how users would interact with the system. And then each time uh, we need to use the simulator, we sample from these different personalities and then come up with, with a different dialogue flow. That way we don't just train a, a dialogue policy for the average user, but uh, we train a dialogue policy that aims to take optimum actions for uh, different user types. And uh, so now going back to data. So how do we get the data? How do we bootstrap all of this? So uh, from day zero, when we get some information source, it doesn't matter what it is, it comes up with some uh, description of how it could be queried. So we sample some user goals from that backend, and then we sample a personality type. Given those two, we actually generate dialogues in the dialogue act language on day zero. So this becomes something like greeting. The system says, how can I help? The user says, hi, greeting. And then uh, says their intent and the restaurant name, which would be something like, hi, I want to book a table at Il Fornaio, et cetera, et cetera. So then we do ask crowd workers to realize this in natural language, generating lots of dialogue. The good thing is, first of all, we can use, because now we do have annotated data, which is actually, if you do it in the reverse way, is very expensive to get. Now we do have annotated data, so we can train natural language generation, conversation language understanding, or dialogue state tracking, or the policies. Uh, but then we can also use this new natural language data to generate more and more natural language dialogues when we train the user simulator as well. So this is basically uh, how we proceed when we go to, go to any new domain. We do generate millions and millions of data and then build models from them. So what is next? Uh, so 
dialogue is challenging. Uh, currently, we are looking into lots of different areas. One of them is understanding meaning beyond words. Uh, Ruhi had similar examples also. Language is very flexible. Things could mean different in, in different contexts. For example, later today could be seven to nine for dinner or three to five uh, for meeting. Uh, personalization is very important. This is, I think, one aspect that is missing in mo most of the personal assistants out there. Having more lively conversations is exciting uh, because we want to go beyond just, okay, what time do we want to do this? And uh, what time, who do we want to meet with, et cetera, et cetera. From these uh, um, plain conversations to richer conversations where the system can actually offer solutions in a, in a nicer way, and, but learn how to do that from users. We target complex conversations where you can have compositional utterances or compositional dialogues that shift from one domain to another. And uh, we target interactions beyond the domain boundaries. So these days, most of these systems work domain by domain, but domain is something that is in the engineer's mind, but not in the users. They don't know what a domain is. They don't know what are the boundaries of a domain. So we want to move beyond uh, these simple domain boundaries. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much.